Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. You could take your seats. Thank you. Is our speaker, our first speaker in the room? Oh, there's Doug. Okay, great. We'll have our panelists come up to the front. Thank you. So I am Erin Ramos. I'm in the Division of Genomic Medicine at NHGRI. I'm really happy to be here to moderate the session titled Effectively Linking Variants to Function. We're going to start with a, a fantastic talk from Doug Fowler, setting the stage, and then we'll turn it over to our panelists. So take it away. I, I really enjoyed the... Um the meeting so far. So it's exciting to be able to talk with you a little bit about trying to understand the functional effects of variants using assays and predictions. And maybe there will be slides at some point. Um, and I just, before I get started, want to thank all my uh, co-panelists. The, the presentation is uh, sort of a collaborative effort. Um, everyone looked at the slides and provided great feedback and also some of the examples that I'm gonna show are, uh, came, from, came from panelists. And so when we think about trying to understand uh, what variants do from the perspective of a, a, of a biologist doing experiments in the lab or, or someone trying to make predictions, it seems like a pretty simple task, right? Variant, those are easy to find if they're single nucleotide variants anyway, and we wanna apply some, some assay or make some prediction that tells us whether the variant is a, is a normal function variant or an abnormal function variant, that, that sounds, that sounds nice and easy, um, but if you sort of get into uh, get into this task and and try to really make it happen, um, it turns out that it's pretty hard. And there are a variety of reasons why that why that is. Um, one that we've talked quite extensively about today is that there are many different types of variation, and uh, in genomics, right, we've gotten quite good at discovering. Uh, all of the types of variation that that are shown on this slide, um, to you know, to differing degrees and with differing um, deployment of technologies, but we're beset by, uh, you know, both coding and non-coding variants, single nucleotide variants, large and small, uh, structural variants, and, and the like, and they all have different requirements in terms of uh, functional modeling and predictions. Another thing that we've uh, talked quite a bit about, and I think we'll talk a lot more about in this session is that if you're an, a, a biologist trying to decide what experiment to do or what prediction to make, you have some really hard choices to make uh, that, uh, that in some cases are, are, are um, hard because the answer may not even be known. And so for example, we can think about what phenotype we would like to measure or predict. So maybe you think you might be interested in the molecular effect of a variant on a protein's abundance or function. We've talked about that today. You might need to think about like what cell type or cell types are the relevant ones to, to think about the variant's effect in. Uh, and that could extend to tissue uh, and organ systems or even like behaviors. Um, additionally, there's the complexity of genetic context, right? So we do have this kind of nice, fairly short list of, of genes and conditions and variants where there are highly penetrant effects and variants sort of have, you know, the same variant has uniform effects in different people, but we run out of that list pretty quickly and genetic context, you know, plays increasing importance. And then there's also the effect of environmental context where, you know, again, uh, uh, many variants effects are modified to the environment. So how is it that we can capture all of these complexities when we're thinking about li linking, uh, linking variants to function? Um, and then the last thing that, that uh, definitely, you know, keeps me up at night and motivates me to come to work in the morning is that we fall further behind every day because you know, sequencing, or at least some types of sequencing, is really cheap, uh, and um, and so we are discovering variants at a pace that that uh, far outstrips our ability to interpret them um, using any any method, and that includes experiments, uh, that includes experiments, and, and to some extent predictions. But this is just you know from pulled from ClinVar, right? Variants of uncertain significance are are uh, exploding, and even updated for twenty twenty four, like things aren't getting any better. So we have to get to work. Um, so, so all that's to say, linking variants to function is, is a challenge. And I'll just use um, a, a few more minutes here to kind of try to summarize the state of, of where my view of where we are uh, 
uh, on the experiment side and where we are on the prediction side. And I'll just preface this by saying, I'm sure that people may disagree with some of these characterizations and that's great. We have a panel discussion um, and I'm sure I might've left some things out. So apologies in advance. I think if we think about um, coding single nucleotide variants, we mostly have the assays we need to diagnose or to measure the effect of some of the, the simpler cases. Um, and uh, people are scaling these assays, which is which is good news, so that we can we can measure the effect of you know all possible variants in a in a in a gene that we're really interested in, and that's been done for a handful of genes, and will be done for a handful uh, and hopefully more uh, in the near future. Um, we have good machinery for sharing uh, variant effect data uh, from experiments for for coding single nucleotide variants, but it's very uneven by gene, and that's because there's not great mechanisms to cause people to share their data in uh, an effective way. So there's lots of data that's like siloed in supplementary tables or PDFs from papers, which is a bummer. Um, the same is true for, um, you know, all manner of, of lower throughput experiments, uh, you know, from mass work to, to, to any, any other kind of work. Um, we, be, thank, thank, uh, thanks to, uh, you know, recent efforts, we now have a pretty good idea how to benchmark these uh, results using both internal controls and clinical gold standard variants. And again, because of recent work uh, uh, from ClinGen and others, we know how to use the data in the clinic at least um, in a first pass way, um, it, provided we can benchmark it. So all that's, uh, you know, I think pretty, pretty good news. On the non-coding SNV side, we have some assays for non-coding uh, SNVs um, uh, uh, that, that work well and others that um, work okay, and then and some that we really need to develop, right? So there's big open questions about how enhancers map to genes that they regulate, and what the meaning and 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 um, and regular and, and logic of variation within those regulatory elements really really is and does. Um, additionally, um, you know there are some some scaling of these assays, but we're not exactly sure which ones to scale. Um, there are nascent data sharing efforts, but we're still on, on the first page there. Same with benchmarking, largely because we lack clinical controls for many types of, of non-coding uh, single nucleotide variation that gives us, us a clear answer. And uh, the discussion is sort of just starting about how to use many of these types of uh, um, variant effect data in the clinic. For structural variation, the picture is really like we're sort of at square one, right? There are a few technologies, namely um, scanning or, or um, program deletion of functional elements and also synthesis of big DNA, which has allowed us to start modeling uh, the effect of structural variants, but we're really just starting there. So we need lots of different technologies and assays. These largely are not being scaled and there's not a whole lot of data to share or translate into the clinic yet. Um, just by way of kind of motivating things, um, I wanna talk about a couple of examples. Um, so one, one paper that was picked and hat tip to Naira from our, our, our panel for pointing this paper out, um, here, uh, uh, this particular spectrum was linked to neurodevelopmental disease and about 30 missense variants were uh, functionally modeled in like this really nice kind of full stack dissection that started from cultured human cell lines and patient derived IPS cells, uh, IPS derived neurons, uh, but also in mice um, that uh, assessed phenotypes sort of ranging from protein stability, so molecular phenomena through cellular phenomena and right on up to behavior. And so, this paper is sort of a really beautiful showcase of how uh, um, ex experiments can can uh, under can can be used to understand variant effects. But this type of uh, full stack approach is really difficult to scale. On the other hand, we have papers like this one focused on DDX3X, where saturation genome editing was used to measure the effect of thirteen thousand coding variants, um, but on a fairly simple phenotype growth uh, of a cultured human cell line. Um, the good news is the data really almost perfectly discriminate between known pathogenic and benign control variants. And as such, the data was able to be used to resolve uh, uh, most of, almost all of the variants of uncertain significance. So this data is great, but it gives really limited mechanistic insight. So that's kind of a, 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 a some, you know, two, two stories that we can think about in our discussion. In terms of computational efforts, on the coding SNF side, um, we have high quality predictions. Alpha missense has been mentioned, and I'll talk about it in a minute. For simple function, so like Caesarian, like yes or no function, um, there's it's easy to access these data and share them. Uh, again, because of recent work, we have uh, uh, really good methods for benchmarking uh, these, these uh, predictions and, um, and uh, uh, using them in the clinic. On the non-coding side, I think we're really still struggling to make high-quality predictions. Um, 
for some of the reasons we talked about before. Uh, and as a, as a consequence, there's, there's you know, not as easy to access or use predictions, um, and we don't really know how to benchmark them, and we're struggling uh, with some notable exceptions that I'll talk about in a second uh, to use these, these predictions in the clinic. And then for the structural cases, I actually struggled to find many algorithms that purport to predict the effect of structural variation. Um, so we're really just starting there. In terms of examples, we've talked about alpha missense. It's a protein language model um, that uh, was trained. It's based on alpha fold, so it's trained on protein structure and MSAs. It's weakly supervised. It ingests population frequency data. But I think the thing that's so interesting about alpha missense and other models like Eve that are sort of in the same category is that it, they largely avoid the circularity problem that has beset some earlier predictors, and so that's that's very exciting. Um, it does pretty well. There are marginal improvements of alpha missense for classifying known pathogenic and benign variants, but it gives me limited mechanistic insight, right? So it just tells you, is this variant fun functional or not? Um, and then another example that's worth paying attention to uh, is actually an older one. It's Splice AI. This is a neural network that predicts um, Splice donor and acceptor sites, and it's trained on free mRNA transcript sequences. It does uh, really, really, really well. It was actually kind of a a phase change compared to previous predictive models. And the reason I picked it to highlight is that it was recently calibrated for clinical use by the ClinGen Sequence Variant Interpretation Group. So this is kind of ex an example of a loop being closed, right? This, this, the, these biologists you know, developed this predictor that did really well, and ClinGen went and considered how this predictor should be used and released a nice assessment along with some rules about how um, people should think about using using the predictor results. And I, I realize I'm glossing over a lot of details, so feel free to point out where I missed things or said things wrong or ask questions uh, in the in the panel discussion. But I think it's it, it's an it's a nice example. Okay, so with that, um, I think the challenges as I see them are that where we do know what data to collect, we're not collecting them fast enough. Our methods often trade off scale and phenotypic with phenotypic complexity or completeness, and that's hard to balance. And there's like honest disagreement about what we should do there. Um, we need lots of new assays and technologies all across the board, and I've highlighted some of those. Um, and then uh, we have some ways to benchmark functional data sets where there are lots of clinical control variants, but actually there aren't that many genes with lots of clinical control variants. And when we're looking at a gene that doesn't have lots of clinical control variants, we don't really know how to benchmark the data, and that's a big problem. Um, and then uh, biologists and tech develop developers, in my opinion, are often not motivated by clinical questions. So we end up with lots of data that's like hard to use in the clinic and needlessly hard to use in the clinic because biologists and tech developers like didn't consider that their data might be useful clinically. Okay, uh, so with that, we can have the panel discussion. Thanks. That was terrific. We're gonna pause momentarily so Sarah can, um update the Zoom so folks online can see the slides. While Sarah's doing that, Doug, I'll ask a quick clarifying question. So I loved how you put the table together and you're giving us a sense of for um, uh, SNVs coding and non-coding then structural variants. And for, you know, for SNVs, you communicated we're probably furthest along, but what, you know, what proportion of in dealing genes, do you think that we've got some of the high throughput assays available for you? You highlighted a few really good um, advances in a couple genes, but is it is it a you know a small fraction of a percent? You mean where we already have data, or where we could generate data tomorrow if we, if we... where where we're I guess yeah where we're teed up where we could generate. I think data. we can yeah I think we can generate like simple functional data, like for growth assays or very simple molecular phenomena for, for most every gene. There are some exceptions, but most every gene, I think we have tech for where we need tech that um, and where we're working, I think is more where we would like to capture that genetic context, that uh, environmental context or the tissue cell and developmental context. Like th that's where we mostly don't have right. assays even for coding SNPs. Okay. Did, and while we're waiting, does anyone have any clarifying questions for Doug or want to amplify anything that he said? So I go with a quick question. So for the structural variants, you said there are no assays. I think there are no assays, good assays even, to, to find the structural variants in, in the individuals with the diseases. So I think we are that far. Yeah, I, I, my understanding is that we, 
we can find structure, some structural variants with long read sequencing, right? And that's kind of the promise. And there, I didn't mean to say there are none. There are some assays for structural variants. We're just at the very, I, my view is that we're at the very beginning of being able to model structural variation. I mean, I really have been taken by some of this big DNA synthesis work that's come out of like the New York Genome Center. Um, and then, you know, there are clever ways to use CRISPR to make deletions, right, targeted deletions. But I'm not aware of other other methods that can deal with more comp like other, other types of events. And even those methods, my understanding is we're, we're just in very early days. So it's like cool to think about, but we're not yet, we're not yet there. I don't know, but it's a neat frontier. So I Here we go. think, are we good, Sarah? Ready to transition? Okay, well, that's fine. We can work with that. And thank you. And thank you, Gerald, for helping us with that. So we'll turn to our panelists now, who again, each have one slide. And uh, our first panelist is Naira uh, Akizu from CHOP, University of Pennsylvania. Okay, so you already introduced me. My lab uh, studies neurodevelopmental disorders. And uh, we deal a lot with what or which uh, models we choose for our uh, studies. So pretty much um, most of the work that uh, we do in the lab started from a couple of genes that we found mutated in neurodevelopmental disorders. And then by studying these uh, genes in iPSC models and mouse models, we have identified other genes that interact with those. And then we have gone to gene matcher or the clinicians at CHOP and interrogated them or asked them if they have patients with variants in those other genes for which we already have models built, right? So then we use our models to study new genes and new genetic mutations. And Gary, there, when you were saying before, how do we engage cell biologists or basic biologists? I think gene matcher, it's a great tool, which is mostly used by clinicians and not that much by uh, people like me. And whenever I talk with others and I show our work, uh, they ask me, oh, how do you find these patients? So most of them come from gene matcher. And I put my, my gene there and then I get uh, contacted with a lot of clinicians that, I, that they ask me, oh, so what's your cohort? And my cohort is a mouse model or, or an IPSC model. So, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, so when, when we find these uh, new uh, variants in those genes that we study, the, the first thing that um, we think about is, okay, so how do we, how do we validate that these uh, variants are uh, deleterious, right? And uh, if we know the function of the gene, or if we have an assay, that's where we start from, right? Like we have biochemical assays or molecular assays that we can build in the lab, simple assays that uh, we can use to, to validate if the variants are uh, deleterious. The problem is that sometimes, um, for neomorphic variants, for example, or for genes that the, the function is not that uh, known, um, we might do the assay and we don't find anything. So negative data um, doesn't mean anything. So if we find that the at molecular level or at biochemical level, there is some uh, effect of the variant, then we think on the next easiest assay is a cellular model, right? And there usually we do overexpressions into 93T cells and try to see if this overexpression change uh, metabolic pathways or epigenomics or something like this. And from there, we go to iPSCs and mice. And uh, we ask uh, about what are the cell types that we are, uh, we are going to be studying, right? Um, and we are talking about neurons and we are talking about neurodevelopmental disorders. So there are lots of type of neurons, lots of type of uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, and each of them might be related with a completely different circuit. So how do we pick the circuit and neuronal type that we are going to be making in, in, in the dish with IPSCs or looking in the mouse brain, right? And that's where we, where, where we struggle. And um, uh, many times when, when, we, when we share our data or we uh, send, submit grants, they ask us, oh, so what, what is the clinical feature or what is the MRI? And can you know what type of neuron is affected by this data? And yes, maybe sometimes you can know, right, that we see cerebellar hypoplasia, so the cerebellum is affected. So we look at the cerebellum. But other times the MRI is completely normal or the, the clinical features don't really tell you anything. So, so there you get stuck and, and we usually then try to use the easiest model we can make, the easiest neuronal type we can make, cortical neurons in IPSCs, and then in mice we look at, uh, at whatever we can look at, right? So uh, how do we solve this problem and how can we make... Um, the, the decision of what 
models we use a little bit more rational. I think there are several approaches that uh, have been um, have been developed or several initiatives like uh, Marvel that have tried to put different type of data sets together, right? Data from uh, population genomic or genome sequencing or, um, or, or human phenotypes uh, together with uh, mouse phenotypes and, uh, and, and, and things like this, right? So you can go to Marvel and look at, okay, is there a, a fly model? Is there a mouse model? What is the phenotype? And then from there, you can uh, start picking the type of cell or the type of model that you are uh, going to be looking at, right? And I think those are great approach approaches that help us maybe narrow down the type of model that uh, we are going to be using. And then thinking about how we can improve this, that's uh, my last sentence over there, is like in my future ideal scenario, I would like to put all the known information that we have out there, right? Like a single cell transcriptomic, single cell metabolomic proteomic that we still don't have there together with uh, our patient phenotypes and uh, genetic data and uh, get like some sort of machine learning and artificial intelligence tell me, okay, so based on this uh, gene variant and all these like expression data sets and metabolomic data sets, the cell types that are affected are this neuron, this microglia, and uh, this blood cell. So now I have like my uh, own um, um, uh, models that I can study in the lab, right? So out there, I live here. Thank you so much. That was that was terrific. So uh, looks like um, Doug, you have another chance to to outline your perspective. Okay. Well, uh, taking off my trying to summarize the field hat and putting on my what do I actually do in my lab hat? Um, and where do I think we're going? We work on large scale variant effect assays, right? That can measure measure the consequences of all possible single nucleotide variants in comparatively simple systems. Uh, and I think where we need to go, so we basically want to fill in this cube, right? Of all the variants by all the genetic and environmental context, by all the phenotypes we could ever measure. That's what we would love to have. And that's an effectively infinite space. We're never going to measure all of it. So I think what we need to do is, is just basically, first of all, collect much more data of all kinds, mouse data, cell data, you know, all the data we can find, but do it in a, in a smart way, right? In partnership with people, and this is really essentially your point also, um, who can create um, uh, uh, models that can allow us to fill in essentially with high quality predictions all, all, all of the cube, because we're never gonna do enough experiments, you know, to measure every variant in every context for every phenotype. So that's where I think we should go. Thanks, Doug. Okay, next up we have uh, Stephen Murray from the Jackson Lab. Great. Well, thanks. I, I really appreciate the invite. I actually came to this meeting expecting to have to carry the banner for animal modeling, but I, I've heard a lot about it already from a number of different groups, so that's great. Um, but I, I think it comes down to my my overall three points I wanted to make come down to the, the the overarching theme of how do we capture complexity, because I think capturing complexity is important to understanding phenotype, which is important to understanding function. Um, and while cell-based systems are great, and I think Doug made the point about the, the cost trade-off between scalability and actual complexity, uh, you miss some of the important, and in fact, in many cases, critical interplay of you know, different cell types, tissues, organs, even the immune system, things like that, uh, that are relevant for understanding a specific disease and, and, and ultimately, in my view, validating whether or not a variant is actually causative, pro providing that uh, corroborating evidence. A great example of this is morphology, an area I work on, which is structural birth defects. Uh, you know, really to understand that morphology, you need to have the phenotype. You can't understand morphology in a dish or you, it's difficult, more difficult to understand morphology in a dish. And I think there are examples of scalable mo animal modeling solutions. I think the, the, the perception is that this is slow. I know certainly my first interactions with clinical geneticists, and I explain how long it takes to make a mouse model and characterize it, and you're talking years. And they, you know, you can see the the listening shut off at that point, right? Because that's not the scale they need to publish the paper, or at least to make some uh, progress in understanding that given variant. So we've worked to develop ways to say, well, we're we're fortunate to be in this era where genome editing has really changed how we approach uh, 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 animal modeling, or or really experimentation in a lot of what genetic experimentation, and both in simple and complex, some um, you know, mouse, zebrafish. Um, uh, see, um, 
Xenopus as well. We have examples where we actually don't have to make mouse models we can, or animal models. We can use what we call a founder screening approach. We just engineer, screen, look for the phenotype, provide that corroborating evidence that this variant is associated with this phenotype or even just the gene. And then that's sufficient evidence perhaps to move the needle in terms of uh, uh, um, understanding you know, whether or not this gene or variant is associated with the disease. And you know, being uh, talking to Sarah, I also sit on a ClinGen panel where this is incredibly valuable to understand how animal model evidence or other experimental evidence can contribute to the curation of these genes. And so we really focused in this. Um, but I also think you know, it doesn't have to be this or that. It can, as, as we just heard, this could be described as you know, part of a tiered strategy, right? So there could be a biochemical or a cell-based screening method that identified key plausible variants for future modeling. And I think there's a lot of value in that. And so um, uh, um, I also think deep modeling, I think Gary's comments from the previous session were, were really useful to me in thinking it's, it, you, going deep has a tremendous value. You can't replace the knowledge that comes from going deep, but that doesn't mean it's not an either or proposition. You can, you can you know, make progress on genes and variants for which we don't know much and go deep at the same time. Um, I also think it's really important, this has come up a few times in this meeting, so I'm just kind of reiterating here and I'll go more quickly, which is to how do we consider the role of genetic context when we're interrogating variants? You know, we've, you know what do we, and what do we miss when we don't do that? And we should know what we're missing or we should know that we are missing things when we do this. So it sort of comes to how we report those data, I think are really important. So we know patients have great phenotypic heterogeneity, you might have the same, certainly mutations of the same gene, maybe the exact same mutation. And we see this huge heterogeneity, Gary mentioned this even in CF. Um, how, what do we do about this when we're modeling things in vitro? I mean, I think there is a, uh, a debate as to whether you want patient-derived iPS cells. Is that a better place to go? Or do you engineer everything on one standardized iPS cell line and, and, and understand that um, uh, or, and examine the phenotype and then what are you missing, right? What are we missing from that genetic context? I think the flip side of it, we, we think about this in the mouse all the time, C57 black six is one person or one genome that we engineer over and over and over again. And we know there's you know, great variability in phenotypic uh, uh, penetrance depending on the on genetic background. So how do we incorporate this into our thinking? I don't have an answer for that. I think it's just an important question to consider. Um, and then the final thing is, I think one thing that I always think about, what about the genes for which we know very little? You know, to what extent is our ignorance of certain genes function, whether it's biological, even biochemical, um, the ignorome, if you will, uh, uh, where, how does that really affect our ability to, to interpret these other assays? I, you know, Doug was speaking of, right, these high throughput assays. If we don't really know what this gene does at all, uh, are we missing something here? And this is, are these places where we should be emphasizing to fill gaps? We have programs that, you know, are meant to do this. So for example, knockout mouse project, we're going after every gene in the genome. We'll understand certainly as a, as a single gene knockout, what does this gene do? We're not going to complete that as an international consortium. We're getting close. We're 80% we're there, which is great. But, and, and Morphic is also one of these other programs that's meant to fill this, but it, it's not these programs. You know, how much should we be doing to fill sort of scientific understanding gaps uh, that would enable um, you know, better uh, high throughput assays for variant identification and, and validation. And finally, um, well, that's basically what my final point is, is how do we do this in these poorly annotated genes? So uh, I'll leave it at that. That's terrific. Our next panelist is Saba Parvez from Northwestern University. All right, thank you for this invitation. It's been wonderful to uh, to hear about this you know, as, as basic biologists. It's been wonderful to hear perspectives from clinicians, from human geneticist's point of view, you know, what are the things that are that are missing? How can we make uh, variant interpretation uh, more widely available? And how can we bring clinicians as well as more basic biologists together? You know, so I uh, thank you, Steve, for laying out the groundwork, you know, for, for looking at uh, looking at how we can use animal model system for for interpreting uh, the functions of various different uh, for uh, different variants uh, in whole animal model system. So uh, Doug uh, laid out really nicely how you know we oftentimes we sort of compromise when we are going looking at more widely we are compromising compromising with the depth 
and vice versa. You know, when we are looking at depth, we are compromising with the with the breadth of things that we can look at. You know, so we are so, sort of trying to find that balance in between. Uh, in between, so how can we look at both depth? as well as the breadth simultaneously, you know, so uh, uh, especially in, 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 in an animal model system, animal model system, you know, so uh, most people, most uh, people here, you know, when you are thinking about modeling uh, genetic variants, you are thinking about at least at large scale, you are primarily doing that in cell culture model system. And while these are great, you can look at different functions, you know, they are phenotypically limited. So animal models, uh, they, uh, they offer a lot of uh, complex phenotype that you can't look at in simpler cellular model system, right? But, and then, uh, but most validations in simpler, in animal model system, they have been relatively low throughput, you know, so you can look at one gene at a time, uh, and we have so many different variants to look at. So the question is, how do we, how do we sort of bridge that gap between being able to look at these variants at a relatively large, at a large higher throughput scale, but still in an in vivo model system? And we have been trying to uh, trying to address this problem by looking at certain model systems that are more amenable to high throughput high throughput screens. For example, you know zebrafish model systems. So typically, people have done either uh, invertebrates or lower invert invertebrates, uh, lower vertebrates. You know these are amenable for high throughput genetic screens. So we are exploring or trying to answer these questions in these uh, in these model system. And uh, some of the challenges that in, in vivo functional validation, you know, that we have talked about is that generation of these variants take time. And like Steve was talking about, you know, now we can do these, uh, we can also look at these uh, uh, functions in founders by doing founder screens, you know, looking at F0. So that's also true for both in mice as well as now in zebrafish as well, we can look at founder screens. So that cuts down the time that's required for doing functional validation. And, uh, and I think the bigger question here is, uh, one of the other questions here is what are the sort of phenotypes that we should be looking at? You know, we have been going at it very, like, do we use the clinical database to find out what phenotypes of interest there is? And we should just tar look at it tar in a targeted way, just looking at those particular phenotypes, or should we go at it when we model that variant in a in an animal model system should we look at more comprehensively do we look at you know all sorts of uh, phenotype all the way from morphological phenotype which is so, sort of something that we have been we have looked at uh, in the past you know but do we also combine other phenotypic approaches like behavior phenotype molecular phenotype you know, and then combine some of these together, like what Naira was talking about, and some sort of uh, using AI or machine learning models to then have predicted basis of how we can use that data set to, to uh, maybe predict how these, how these different variants are sort of coming together to influence or uh, to uh, influence a particular phenotype that we observe. You know, so those are some, of, again, I don't think these are, uh, these are uh, solutions, you know, these are more questions that, that, that we need to think of as a, as a group when we are trying to model, uh, model these uh, different variants in an in vivo uh, or in cell model systems. Thank you. And our last panelist, Steve Riley from Yale School of Medicine. Oh, <laughs> you know, I know what I said. So, <laughs> you know, I, I sort of outline, um, you know, three sort of key areas um, and in, in the focus on the non-coding genome. So back to this idea of genetics is complicated. And, you know, the non-coding genome, especially regulatory elements in the genome are inherently there to be integrating cell identity, cell state environmental response. And so those questions are especially important when we're thinking about the non-coded um, genome. And no, okay. <laughs> I know, I've been trying, I can't. Yeah, I'm not touching it. I tried once. <laughs> Sorry, Steve, thanks for your No, questions. it's fine. So I, I'll keep going. So I think one of the, the first main challenges we have is, is a need for more technology. We have really good tools for understanding variation in the non-coding genome, MPRAs, CRISPR screens, but they're really still limited towards understanding molecular phenotypes. And clearly we need to be moving more towards organismal phenotypes, phenotypes in between, there we go, 
there we go it makes sense great um you know and things that are um actually related to disease and this is a question that's obviously come up before but how do we balance this generalizability versus disease relevance and one of the extra limitations here is that this, the non-coding genome is just so much larger and so that need for such a large scale inherently really pushes us up against that question of generalizability versus disease relevance. Um, and, you know, right now it's still kind of the wild west of a lot of these types of, of methods. And so the lack of uniform approaches is really limiting our ability to integrate all this data and sort of learn the underlying non-coding regulatory grammar, which I'll touch on in the third point. Um, and so, you know, the, the second point is sort of we have these complex genetic architectures and it complicates which variants to study and why. And inherently these non-coding variants are often of lower effect size. And so they make sense in terms of understanding them in relation to large effect variants, rare variants, somatic variants, common trait variants. And so thinking about how we pick the variants we study, you know, even just understanding pairs of variants at this point is something that we're not really doing all that well or all that effectively. And thinking about um, what context will get the most bang for our buck to study first is something I think would be an interesting point for discussion. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, one really important point is that in the non-coding gene, we especially start to rely on things like conservation and constraint as informators of function, sort of this maybe though tenuous relationship, because we don't really understand how those two metrics relate to function across different traits, uh, different diseases, different cell types. Um, and we know even, you know, from AlphaFold and Primate AI that they're so incredibly important for informing the coding uh, genome. We need to really understand where and how much they're important for the non-coding genome. Um, and lastly, sort of modeling non-coding variant effects is really still in its infancy. It's unclear what data types and what data are the best to actually understand the underlying regulatory grammar of the genome. We're starting to get better at building models that can predict Lot, lots of the you know experiments that we do. So we can predict RNA expression, we can predict epigenetic features, but the ability to understand a variant effects on those, we're not quite there yet. I think we'll get there quite quickly, but um, it's sort of open of how we take those models and we extend them to that full cube that Doug was talking about. Um, and I, I really think that you know merging functional data, foundational models, and statistical genetics as a, as a as causal inference models it's an interesting potential solution to get at this. And I think fundamentally our goal should be able to build prospective maps of non-coding variant function, even just for the simpler molecular phenotypes is maybe our first goal before we start to get to more complicated uh, phenotypes. Thank you. That was terrific. Um, so we heard perspectives from five of our panelists before we, or I jump into some questions. I was just curious if the those of you in the audience had specific questions or follow-up points that you wanted to make gary yeah that was great um so there's one other uh model i just want to ask you guys about which is the uh, human uh, animal model hybrids where you know you place human sequences in, in directly because we had to do this with uh sickle cell right we couldn't really get the animal model to work until the human sequence. maybe steve you can answer this one but but I, but there's been also great successes with yeast, right? Uh, because it, depending on the function of the protein, you can use yeast, which is, you know, the awesome power of yeast genetics, as we know, and you can rapidly run through things as opposed to doing it in a mouse. It can take a lot longer. So choosing the right model system, but also whether or not we, we've underutilized the opportunity to use hybrids. Uh, and the yeast, I'm thinking of the Progera story and, and so forth. So um, is is there... Are you guys doing this, or is that something that's just too tedious to to create these hybrids and breed them out and get them to be faithful, or is is it is is there any space for uh, movement in that area? I guess is what I'm asking. Well, yeah, I can say what we've been doing in terms of humanization, and it's actually you know you made the point, Gary, in the last session that when we're 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 looking to validate. We're also looking to build models that could be useful downstream for potential cures if we're putting models on the ground. So our humanization, we just call it simple humanization, is to put either small pieces of sequence that might be a target for an ASO or a target for a genome editor or something like that. We anticipate that as a potential genetic therapy in building our models. Um, it can be whole genes if there's other sort of pharmacological uh, uh, interventions imagined where, where the 
where, you know, the enzymatic properties between the species are different enough so that, you know, you want an inhibitor that's going to function specifically for that, for that target. There's enough variant between the target. Um, it, it also adds some challenges. Sometimes if you humanize an exon for AMP, for instance, perhaps that exon doesn't play well with the rest of the gene. Or if you humanize a whole gene, perhaps that gene doesn't play well with the rest of a complex, right? And so there's some, a lot of thinking back and forth uh, on, on the extent of that humanization. Ultimately, I think it, it, it depends on your question. And I think these are cases where this is where the diving deep is really where these sorts of models are produced. Because, you know, if you're building a tool to test a, a round of inhibitors that require whole gene humanization, but you're using a biochemical assay that you know this gene functions in isolation, that should be great. Um, but if you're just creating something that uh, would be a, a base editor target, you only need about 40 base pairs, 20 on each side for that to be an effective amount of humanization. Uh, really, it's question dependent. My thinking was, was uh, if I could just, just follow that up, um, is this an area where more resources need to be applied if we think this will move the needle faster? Right. I, I, for, for therapeutics, again, which I think is the end product we're after, right, it, it, for all of our work, I mean, it's not just it. It's obviously knowledge, understanding of pathophysiology. I don't want to do the MD shortcut to that point. But um, but, but they, what you just mentioned, they're incredibly valued. You get a whole gene replacement, right, and you can put any variant you want in there, and it replicates thing. Now you've got a target, and it's a little easier to convince the FDA you're going after a human target, right? And this is some of the discussions that have been held is, and how far are you going to go with this? So, but the system is is fraught with uh, technical challenges, I, yep. I understand. But is is there, as has been successful with yeast and some of the other systems, is, is yep. there something on the horizon that might move as fast as so thinking of the comp project and knocking out all the yeah. genes? Do you think there's some I, I, I think get there sooner? Yeah, I think genome editing technology has really changed the landscape of what we can accomplish from an engineering perspective. I think it's still early days, um, whether it's you know something you have to do in stem cells first and then engineer, for example, a mouse model. I know uh, Jeff Boca has a, had a big seg project that was around replacing huge pieces of the genome, but they're not huge, huge. They're big, but not super huge. So I agree. I actually think there's still more to be done. I don't know if we're on the cusp of some fundamental shift in the technology, but I do think there's been incremental progress. And I think, yes, I think there's a lot of value in this. There's a lot of interest from what I what I can see in continuing to advance that technology. Thanks. Yep, Lisa and then Deanne. Humanization might be to put human cells into uh, animal models, yes. right? So there are examples of this uh, Bardes Trooper's lab with Alzheimer's disease, he has done this. And I, I think it's something that um, it's interesting, especially for disorders that cannot be modeled properly in, in, in animals, right? Okay, so my question is, all the things that we've talked about here that we need to do to functionally validate the variants that we're looking at, like they seem beyond the scope of one lab to do. Um, especially if you're not really invested in like one disease, one phenotype. Uh, so we have, as you've all mentioned, we have a lot of programs that exist that are generating large scale data that is related. So we have got things like comp, we've got Morphic, we've got IGVF, we've got all these different uh, programs out there. My question for you guys is, if we had like this amazing AI system that Nayara <laughs> was talking about, um, do we have all of the data somewhere that we need and we just don't have it together in a way that we can do what we need with it? Or are there data sets that are you're not aware that people are generating that need to be generated to really fill in the gaps to get to that ultimate sort of um, full data set? Yeah, I think we don't have the data sets. We are trying to, right? So so there are lots of resources where we can look for single cell uh, transcriptomic data, right? And many times when we try to find models, we go to all these like broad single cell uh, portal or the UCSC cell, and we look at, okay, where is this gene expressed in uh, all these like brain single cell RNA data sets, right? Um, but that's not 
in an integrated in it's not integrated yet right and uh, and that's only for the brain so if we think on all the organs and all the systems right i don't think we are there yet and then the other part is the what we have discussed already right like the the the, the phenotypes of the individuals with the diseases right so we 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 don't have all the picture of the of the of those clinical features either that can guide us towards the right model that you that we can uh, that we we need to use right so plus then many other uh, assays that we haven't started generating yet right many other data set proteomic metabolomic and all this but even like the most simple or the more the most accessible data set that i can think of uh, which comes from from the individuals with the disorders and from all these uh um, single cell transcriptomic data set is not in an integrated way or it's not completed yet, right? Or most models. Yeah, I was going to say that things like COMP and Morphic, and the, I think the intention from the beginning of those programs was to make the data accessible, and it is. So I think in terms of potential data uh, accessibility and usability is there for sure. Um, the question is about integration with the human genetics data set. So can you find comp data on, or any animal model data when you're in the animal, right? And you're, oh, look at this variant. Oh, look, oh, there's, you know, and I know Marvel has tried to do a lot of that is to pull things together. They call themselves the kayak, I think, of uh, uh, genetics research. And so I think there's been efforts in that space, but I think there's certainly more to do. The data I worry more about is the variant testing data that doesn't pan out. That's the one that I think is the negative data that doesn't get published, the negative data that's sitting in individual investigators, and there's no place for them to put it. I mean, I guess you could publish mm -hmm. a bio archive your negative data, but then that, how is that accumulated, right? And, and how would that be curated, say, by ClinGen or something like that? So I think that's the big gap in my mind is, is the data that's not produced as one of these big consortia or where they don't have a format to share those data effectively uh, uh, without, now I think, we're meant to describe how we're going to be sharing our data uh, in all of our NIH grants now. And I think that's great, uh, but I don't think the systems are there to share lots of negative data. So for example, the comp portal, IMPC portal, it's really not set up to take other data types. It's only set up to take the data that was produced in the way that that program produced it. So, yeah. So let's follow up on that point. I see Heidi raised her hand, uh, Nara, and then I think Doug, you had something to add, but yeah, let's, let's stay on this thread. Go I ahead. just want to follow up on that question of the negative data. I think it's a really great point, but it is actually pretty easy to just submit it to ClinVar. I admit, like, figuring out what the best format and everything is, but when someone's trying to interpret a variant, that's the first place they go. And I recently worked with a group who was just doing uh, essentially statistical association studies for whether there's a phenotype associated with carrier status. And they were able to prove with, with through the FinGen study that a bunch weren't associated. And I was like, just submit them with no interpretation, submit them into ClinVar with, you know, and you can auto populate the text that says, you know, P value. And they, and they, they're working on just putting that in and, you know, it, the, all the BRCA functional data went in with no interpretation because they didn't look at all the evidence. But it was a way to at least get that in there, and then everybody sees it because everybody looks in ClinVar first. Nara? No, I, I, mine is also on that because I think it's very important to have that information that a mouse model for that one variant in that gene was created and that the phenotype of cleft palate was not identified, right? So we, we another lab is not trying to model the same variant or if they are trying to model the variant, they know what was the phenotype that was investigated because that's another thing that we come across. We are trying, oh, I want a mouse model for a cardiac, cardiac anomaly, but the mouse model is talking about intellectual disability. And I don't know if the cardiac anomaly was investigated or not. And so I don't know how in ClinVar that would go um, high the inner format that could be actually like easily assessed computationally that people don't have to be there and reading and trying to find the little details. But I think that would be important to have a place where this data is structured in a way that computers can, we can use it computationally to inform what we need to do. I was just gonna say, in, in theory, mouse genome informatics can do that. Um, but I think the, the biggest issue is encouraging investigators to submit it. 
they don't, you know, you, they take what people submit, but if people don't submit their negative data, they're not going to know about it. And, and you can, they have APIs, so you can pull the data. And I think a lot of clinical geneticists now know how to look at the mouse data and MGI. I think it's a stop that certainly curators go to at some point. Uh, so, um, but linking that into other databases and other systems that, that clinical geneticists would typically access, I think is an odd added uh, thing that should be done. So, I think I think that's a yeah, good point yeah. on messaging because I think a lot of people just aren't thinking about that. So what, whatever we can do to get more people to submit that negative data, you've been so patient, Dan. Has anyone in the panel used organoids um, for validation? Organoids for validation. Organoids. Steve, I mean, do you want to start down there? I'm just curious, like how they perform, or like in terms of validation of a of a function, functional validation. I yeah, know. I mean, we've again in the non coding space, largely just looking for molecular phenotypes. So we've done, you know, CRISPR screens and massively powered reporter assays on to try to identify variants that are altering regulatory function in organoids. Inherently, the throughput gets lower just because it's usually dependent on number of cells. Um, interestingly, we often just find different causal variants, not sort of uh, wrong ones or better than our cell lines. It's just that like, you often find different things that are real in, in different cell contexts. And it's really, I think, just the fact that no, no single cell type or organoid is going to find everything. And so it's often piecing together from many different aspects to get at, you know, we were looking at schizophrenia variants. And so we found some that were very real that were genetically fine mapped in you know, really easy to work with cancer cell lines. We found completely different ones that worked well in organoids. Doug? I just want to jump in to answer that question. Do I? We don't work with organoids, but I think your question, it, it's a great one. And I think that it, un, like the question underlies what in my opinion is a lot of like confusion about functional modeling, which is a lot of like pointless fighting in my opinion about the best model system, which tends to follow fashions like Organoids are trending, like zebrafish are down. Like that's, <laughs> in my opinion, that's like absolutely the wrong way to think about it. We do work with IPS cardiomyocytes in my lab extensively, and they are not as good as you would think they might be for some things. They're excellent for other things. So the way we approach it in my lab is one should use the simplest model system that one can to measure the phenotype that one wants for the types of variants one's interested in and no simpler. And if you can bias towards human models, my personal view is you should, but, but it's, it, you know, I think it, it's very dangerous when we get into a discussion of like, what's blanket best. And I know your question wasn't exactly motivated that way, but I just wanted to jump in and say my piece. Go ahead. One of the themes I heard across a couple of the speakers is the concept that the researchers are really interested in doing functional validation or functional data. And obviously on the clinical side, there's a lot of interest in getting patients' variants going through these functional validations. Like how do we lower that threshold where you're not just sort of co-opting gene matcher, which wasn't intended for that, to accomplish it? Like what sort of systems would be in play that would enable, you know, clinicians to say, this is a variant that I would love to have a functional validation on without having to do what we traditionally do, which is just cold email a bunch of different researchers in the field, which is not probably the most efficient system for doing that. Maybe we need to build a gene matcher for biologists or basic biologists <laughs> that clinicians can get in. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just going to say something about gene matcher. Uh, gene matcher was actually created for that also, Andrew. So like we actually intentionally allow um, researchers who are basic biologists to use it to find the other like interested people in that one gene. And one of the first papers that came out of gene matcher was actually between a, a clinician and a mouse model researcher. And then there are many other cases like Nayara um, said that you contact and it's actually a biologist that has a functional study. So it is one of the, the, the goals of gene matcher to connect people like that. The other one that came out is model matcher, but model matcher is for for animal models, uh, not so much for cell models. 
and they use like they are used for mouse model, East model, or Drosophila, and they are trying to connect people who have a gene like you're saying and want a, a model for that one variant or that one gene and investigate the phenotype. So it's connected through much match, match make exchange also to the other nodes. It's called model matcher. So we have like, that's what we have at this point. Okay, right here and then Sandhya. So I just wanted to add in um, from a functional biologist perspective, like some of these um, assays are actually quite expensive. And so I think some of the limitation is not that we don't wanna do the functional work, but it's that we, have to be able to afford to do it. And stem cells and animal models are, are super expensive model systems. So if there were um, programs or support in place that could help uh, support the analysis of these rare variants, that would be very helpful for the community. Yeah, I think some of those programs exist already. The scale just isn't there to, to accommodate, I think, all the need. So we're part of a... Um, uh, office director funded U54 network. There's three of us, and we one of the remits is to, you know, work with the external clinical research community or patient community to build models where they're needed. Um, but you know, the numbers here are in the dozens, maybe at max, and that's not going to get us over the hump. So I think maybe a more an integrated program or additional nodes or something like that is what would be needed to to be able to centralize those specific more expensive activities. The other advantage is you can centralize the expertise as well for interpreting, you know, those models. Sandhya and then Heidi. Yeah, so I was thinking in terms of, can you use your mic, please? No, not working. Is it working now? Oh, okay, great, thank you. I wanted to keep it far away because I didn't want to hear the uh, grating sound, but um, so in putting tools together, one of the things I was thinking was, to lower the bar for physicians to know where they could get the models to be functionally validated on which model. Sandhya, could you speak up just a little? Yeah. We're having trouble hearing you. Okay. Um, how about now? Yeah. Okay. Hopefully that's not too loud. Uh, but I was thinking in terms of putting tools together to reduce this bar of physicians knowing where maybe they could get their um, genes, the variants validated, like functional analysis done. I was thinking if we could put the gene matcher together with something like alpha fold to understand what is the impact of the variant, what what you know what what could it cause, and then if you could like combine that to an AI tool that would look for potential models that could be used, uh, or even maybe PIs that are working on the specific gene to help then essentially come up with a study design, right? to study. I don't know if that's possible, but. That's more or less what model matcher does. Model matcher does almost exactly what you described. So that's maybe something that we need to, to let the community know more about, even because the last meeting that we had, they did say that very few people are going out of model matcher to the other nodes of matchmaker exchange. So I think that's what we need to just make a community know more about model match. So, so it's, it's exactly what you have described. Right. But I was just thinking to put the alpha fold in the middle so yeah, that... The fold is not there yet. Yeah, because st mm -hmm. to know what impact it could be rather than studying everything, right? Yeah. We have Heidi as a quick follow-up and then Ali and Lisa. And oh, and someone in the back. Thanks. I'm having trouble seeing back there. So wait. Go ahead, Heidi. So I will just comment that most of the groups use all these in silico predictors um, as the first line of wondering what the variant might do. But but my point is actually um, thinking about functional assays in a slightly different way, which is we can learn a lot from the patient. You know, often we get a vague phenotype at the time of testing. Then you get your VUS back in a essentially a candidate gene. And then what happens next? Well, the physician starts digging in to that diagnosis to see if there's other features that may be more pathognomonic to, for the disease than the, the vague neurodev phenotype or whatever it is. And I, I also think we should really think about ways to capture that phenotyping that happens after the diagnosis is returned. Because honestly, 
a lot of times we figure out the variant's pathogenic because there's some very, you know, not every disease has this, but sometimes really specific phenotypes um, or follow-up enzymatic assays or other things that are run clinically that can help inform that variant. So I just want to make sure that we're thinking about ways, because really we do it incredibly poorly today, to capture that follow-on phenotyping. Thank you. Um, Al, let me just make sure we don't. Do you have a uh, same point or a new, new direction? New, okay, go ahead, Doug. We'll just... just to amplify, like it's so great when that data is in a database and I can go like that, like that type of control information is what makes validating functional a functional assay easy because I can say like, oh, there's a clinical endpoint that got measured and like my assay either captures that endpoint or it has no correlation to it. Right, in, or in the, also in the other way around, right? So we do these assays and we found a phenotype that hasn't been reported in the in the patient, right? So going back to the clinician and asking and checking for that phenotype in, in the patient, I think it's always helpful and reassuring for both sides. Ali? Um, just going back to your comments about alpha missense, you know, is there um, some appetite to actually mine the gene matcher database? So not by an individual you know, that's necessarily participating, but just that part of the model that it's learning. So when it sends out an email, it's not just a match, but it's actually all the matches are loss of function variants in this in this gene. And it might be, you know, pointing to some sort of phenotype. Do we have a concept of cleaning up? Maybe, you know, some people put everything into gene matcher and that's not good either, right? Um, to clean up some, some of these entries. So, you know, some of the more, um, I think, relevant variants are coming up. But is there ways that we can be mining these data sets that already exist and then appending them with additional metadata. Like if there is phenotypic information or additional functional information assays that it could be put into one place just to make the barrier like a bit easier on, on so, folks. So in gene matcher, you cannot put more than 10 genes per patient. So you have to mine your list down to 10 genes per patient. So yeah, but there's still, there's some groups. Every are, entry is not very, Every, yeah, selected. I can't yeah. control what people pick as yeah. their candidates, but, and then we, we, we did publish a paper two years ago that went through um, in silico predictors for the genes that were there. Um, and then it, it, we report like what are the genes, what percentage of the genes that matched a lot, for example, had a, a PLI score higher than whatever, missense Z score higher than whatever, uh, what um, and what the genes that match the, the the least, what were these scores for them? So we had we we did an analysis like that. The one thing is like when we Nara, just to keep in mind, we have a couple other hands raised. So maybe to what's we're at the point now. Did we I answer your question? Just to have quick responses. I I I would I would stop you, but. We, we can follow up. Yeah, but like we have we have done these things to address what you are saying. Thank you. Okay, all the way in the back. And then. Yeah, this works. So uh, actually my question is uh, a follow-up on uh, Heidi's point. Um, I was thinking, I mean, most of the uh, functional gene validation are based on models that oftentimes don't replicate the phenotype that we have in the disease. So we need to trigger the model. We need to treat the model. We need to put it under certain stress to, to get to the point where it might at some point replicate some of the phenotype or one phenotype uh, or one aspect of the phenotype. So is there a way to actually start thinking about phenotype specific models that could better sort of reflect the biology and, and actually the effects of the variants on the biology of cells or tissues or, or the organism rather than doing the opposite. And we've have, we have like now a collection of models and a collection of genes that have been studied and probably phenotypes associated with those. Or is there a way to sort of do backwards and start from the phenotypes that exist and start classifying those and seeing whether we can match them with other genes that are in similar families and similar pathways. So there it's, we could be creative and approaching that through with modeling, like with machine learning or with sort of experimental validation. Thank you. Anyone on the panel want to respond to that? I, I think it's a really interesting idea. Um, 
certainly all the databases are there. They have genetic perturbations, but you can pull all the phenotype data for, say, mouse or probably other model organisms as well. And I think that's a really interesting approach. One thing that um, we've been exploring is, and, and for a totally different reason, the reason is we we know sometimes we put model something and it doesn't pan out and we don't know the reason and we sometimes suspect or frequently suspect we're not on the right genetic background, right? We've selected you know, a convenient genetic background, but perhaps one that the context is not sufficient for it to be, uh, uh, for the phenotype to be present. So we've actually been phenotyping other um, strain backgrounds extensively and also both looking at their transcriptomes, but also just gross phenotypes uh, with the idea is that could we predict a sensitized background or could those phenotypes, as you said, be interesting in terms of the, you know, sort of what, what their genetic makeup is. So it's more relevant to complex traits generally than rare disease, but also could provide a, a platform for, for identifying sensitized genetic backgrounds for engineering purposes. Thank you. Just maybe offer a slightly a different perspective and maybe a little bit of a controversial one. So we just heard a lot about complexities around modeling impact of uh, functional impact of variants in models, right? Why don't we talk about cell line models or mouse models and then correlating them to human clinical phenotypes. And then on top of that, of course, for each individual patient, we have no, not necessarily the ability to predict uh, issues like, you know, penetrance within a particular patient, variability and all these other things. So uh, just tongue in cheek, wouldn't it be great if there was a functional model uh, that we could use that's in the patient using the same DNA that we use to sequence the patient. And uh, I, I may be in a wrong session uh, this morning because I tend to think about DNA methylation profiles or epi signatures as functional evidence of disruption of variants within the patient. So I think in a lot of ways, um, epi signatures, DNA methylation epi signatures are exactly the functional model that we talk about as scalable, reproducible, low cost and done in the patient on a particular variant with all its considerations, right? Uh, I just I wanted to ask the, the panel what your opinion on this opinion is. <laughs> Panelists? Go ahead, Doug. Um, I mean, I think observational studies like that are great, but we've learned, I, I think it's fair to say, from 50 years of doing biology that it's really important to do good observations and it's also really important to do good perturbational like experimental biology because they are they are like you know two halves of a whole right they tell us different things and i think that's especially true when we're thinking about rare disease where n is not large like it's one thing if you can build up you do your you know your observational work whether that's epigenome or whatever else on a thousand people who have the same disease right but if you're looking at an n of 1 or an n of very few I think it's very hard to tell sometimes like what the patterns exactly mean. And at the same time, you know, when you have experiments that can recapitulate, you know, some, but not all of those patterns, for example, maybe it gives you a better sense of like what, so anyway, I guess I, I view that as a yes and not an either or type situation. Lisa. I was going to ask the question earlier, but I lost my place. So, but Anshul Kantaji, is apparently on the Zoom with his hand up. Oh, and I'm, so I'm. Thank you. I'm Anshul right now. So okay. Anshul, you can. Sorry, I think Anshul. hopefully mute, unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, thanks, uh -oh. Lisa. Can you hear me? Yes. Sounds okay, clear. Great. So uh, I, I just had a quick uh, follow-up comment slash I guess maybe semi question on on uh, the idea of using models like AlphaFold and so forth uh, to help identify. Uh, uh, model systems that might be good uh, for validating variants. So I think it's not just predictions. Uh, so from from what I can tell, where models have been incorporated, they've been used as black boxes. You just make predictions and the predictive scores get used. Uh, I think it's, uh, a, it's, it's sort of a big mistake for the non-coding genome to do it that way. Um, the reason... Uh, the underlying sort of sequence logic that drives effect sizes can be quite different between cellular contexts and still give very similar scores. And so I think our actual, like, I think a very important consideration, this is not so much the case for things like AlphaFold, which are like context insensitive. They will give you the same structure prediction irrespective of 
cell type A or B, which is technically maybe also incorrect. But for the non-coding genome, uh, predictors are context specific and you can interpret them. And the interpretations are actually very important to decide which contexts are actually relevant for what variant, for what disease. So just want to add sort of this additional con component of um, the underlying interpretation of the models will really matter for non-coding variant, um, you know, prioritization and also linking up effects, predicted effects in, in model systems versus in vivo. Thank you, Ancho. Anyone want to respond or add anything to that? Yeah, I think I would just, I totally agree with Ancho. I think that it, it, it does always come down to having the right data to build those models, right? And figuring out how to take the data we do have and fill in the rest of, again, I'm going to go back to Doug's giant cube of uh, phenotype by context by variant. And so I think that's a really important part of the modeling that needs to be done of how can we use, like, is it, is it RNA-seq? Is it attack-seq that lets us move our models into new contexts so we can make these predictions more broadly as opposed to just the, you know, relatively few cell types and contexts we have currently. Thanks. Lisa, I, I want to make sure, did I miss your question? Well, so, no, well, okay. So some of the things that we've been talking about here seem a little bit like chicken problems. So we talked a lot about how difficult it is to like match up with bio, biologists who can help you with the functional modeling of things. But what I, in Gregor, we sometimes talk about this, like, it's hard to decide that you feel so strongly about a variant that you're going to go to that sort of level of doing that. So how do you sort of bridge the gulf between those two so that you can get a variant through the full sort of range of functional validation? Or how do you know what are the right things to really move forward? How do you convince yourself enough to actually go to the step of finding somebody to do it? So I can go. Uh, so in my case, I think the first thing that I convinced me is to have like more patients that have variants in the same gene, right? Um, then I can focus on that gene. Um, and then we try to do some sort of like, like alpha um, missense or some sort of predict predictive analysis to know if the if the variants are affecting something, the structure or something of uh, in the protein, right? But um, but yes, I don't know. It's a little bit of prediction and a little bit of um, of uh, having like several patients with variants in the in the in the same gene. And then maybe we can start doing some 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 functional like a simple assays, right? If we have a simple model that it doesn't take like a we can do in a couple of hours and it's not expensive. So so those are the the, the things that convince ourselves to move on and uh, do a little bit more of a functional validation. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Yeah, we have about one minute left, so maybe the, yeah. well, the two right. of you I'll can respond and then we'll wrap up. I think uh, oftentimes, it's also comes down to you know how penetrant the phenotype is uh, is in the human population. So, and also whether you are interested in the biology, uh, you know, as a basic researcher, you know. So those are also two right. things that sort of guides uh, whether you will be interested in modeling those variants in the model system. Just one final thing, I think, um, if we're thinking from the perspective of a group like Gregor deciding, oh, what's significant. What do we feel strongly enough to send over to you? I think somehow, sometimes the communication of what that bar is maybe needs to be revisited. So we are trying to, both of us, develop methods that the bar is much lower, right? It's not what we're doing. The number of phenotypes is limited, but the bar is much lower because, you know, built into it is the assumption of a failure rate, you know, and it only takes a few months. It doesn't take two years. So I think more communication about what the, um, uh, uh, what what the resources are and what our bar is for for accepting a project is probably required. And Eric, can I follow yes, up? Sure, go ahead, Carolyn. And this this I'm going to put as a question for people to think about, and then we'll revisit it tomorrow. Is as I'm listening to this conversation, how much of this is do we think we need a way to improve the communication between groups and the awareness of what data is out there or what data is wanted, versus how much do we think there's App, there's data that's missing that we know we should generate without that sort of versus like how would you balance those two things the sort of matchmaking types of aspects versus 
the filling in holes of a data generation. That's not to answer now, but to think about and we'll revisit tomorrow. Thanks, Carolyn. Well, thanks for a great session. I think we'll thank our speakers, panelists. And do we have a break now? Okay, we have a break. And what time do we come back? 4.10, thank you. It's on the screen.